Tom Clark's 6M Podcast is a Boink Studios production. And now, on with the show. Hey, hey, what is up? Welcome to Tom Clark's 6M Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Clark. And in this episode, I'm joined by co-hosts Phil Lindsay and Ray Dean. The Marvel Netflix shows continue to be perhaps one of the, I was going to say oddest segments of the MCU, so to speak. Maybe oddest isn't the right word. It's one of the most original, most unique. It's like a moment frozen in time, man. If anybody out there followed the Marvel Netflix shows, you know what I mean. Because fast forward now... As we're recording this in September of 2023, I don't usually dox the time, kids, but here we are. I'm letting the cat out of the bag. But if you really look back on it, dude, those shows kind of sit in sort of like a bubble, to me anyway. So when we're going back to when we start reviewing some of these shows, we've reviewed Daredevil before. We talked about John Barenthal's Punisher. We've mentioned Jessica Jones in passing. We've talked about the Defenders in passing. Today, of course, as you see from the topic, we're tackling Luke Cage, Okay. But going back and watching these episodes for the first time in a while, I'm telling you, man, at least for me personally, this show really feels like it's kind of trapped in time and not so much as a negative way, right? But anyway, to me, that's how it all really feels. It it still feels fresh. It still looks like it's maybe it was just made. We know that's not the case, and we got a lot to get into here today in terms of what was done, what could maybe happen in the future, and everything in between. But... Yeah, I'm anxious to hear everybody's thoughts. We've got a three-man crew here today, a three-man band for you kids. So just you wait and see. It'll be fun. Let's get to it. Marvel's Luke Cage is an American television series created by Cheo Hadari Coker for the streaming service Netflix based on the Marvel Comics character of the same name. It is set in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, yes, the MCU, acknowledging the continuity of the franchise's films, which is really fun, by the way and was the third Marvel Netflix series leading to to the crossover miniseries, The Defenders. The series was produced by Marvel Television in association with ABC Studios, with Coker serving as showrunner. The show ran for two seasons. First season released September 30th, 2016. The second season, June 22nd, 2018. 26 episodes total. Approximate running time, 44 to 69 minutes. And there you have it, kids. There's your lowdown for Marvel's Luke Cage. So, Phil, we have talked about Daredevil. We have alluded to the Defenders. We've mentioned Jessica Jones. We've mentioned, you know, Iron Fist. And, you know, we've talked about the the street-level heroes here. You know, the, 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 you know, again, not Avengers, not the bright lights of Hollywood, but the, the, the street level heroes here of the Marvel Netflix shows. I think I know what you're going to say, but I'm not, I'm, I'm going to ask you first before I just assume what's your overall take on the Luke Cage series? Number one. And number two, have you watched this show in a while? Has it been a while since you've seen it? I haven't seen it in a while. I remember really enjoying it when it debuted. Um, I still think to date, no other Marvel um, show has a better soundtrack. Oof. And I just don't even think it's close. Um, I think it has the best theme song of any of the Marvel shows. It has the uh, best use of music. It's just not even close. Um, I, I think uh, overall it's a good cast and it's a good um, good representation of Luke Cage as a comic character. Um, can't say it's my favorite of the Netflix shows. I think it's it's far and away Daredevil. I uh, I'm with you on that. I'm especially with you on the soundtrack. I stepped out of the office today to get to grab a sandwich, and I had it on in the car, and it was it, even even the the stuff with no lyrics. It's just music to the show is fantastic. It sounds like the Trouble Man soundtrack by Marvin Gaye. Like it just gritty and raw. It sounds like a '70s show set well in New York City. I mean, yeah. it's just. Dude, it's fantastic. Yeah, uh, production from Ali Shahid Muhammad um, mm-hmm. of Tribe Called Quest. Um, and I think there's other producers on it, but he's like one of the more famous producers on it. Um, nah, I think the opening theme is really good. Um, 
And all the original music they made for it is also dope. There's the song that plays in the first season where he has to fight with Diamondback that is incredible. Really good soundtrack. It is instantly recognizable, too. When you hear the intro and the the credits song at the end is very recognizable. Uh, so, yeah, I'm with you 100%. Ray, so when it comes to Luke Cage, for you personally... Where, do, where are you ranking the Luke Cage series among the Netflix, Marvel Netflix shows for you, in your opinion? In my opinion, it's definitely up there. I mean, I don't want to be redundant and kind of chop on uh, Phil's uh, back with this, but the soundtrack is insane. Some of the music artists they've had on the show, you know, Wu-Tang has been insane. Mm. Uh, I, I'm a huge fan of the soundtrack. I, I think they haven't done anything that good since. Um, I do like Daredevil better. Um, but Luke Cage is up there. I think the whole plot and the fact that it built up characters and the story built, it wasn't very, you know, slow paced where things dragged and nothing progressed and the storylines weren't building up. It was actually, in my opinion, a very fast paced moving parts type of situation where everything kind of gelled, made sense. So I was into it because, you know, there was always something new, new characters and new plots, but it built on, you know, each episode built on the next episode. And, you know, something that, I, as both you guys said, Daredevil, and by the way, I'm in agreement that Daredevil was, I don't want to say the better series, but it's, I enjoyed it more. And I think it was, it, it was definitely was deeper and the storylines were a lot richer but, you know, to be fair, if we're talking about, you know, OK, I'll put someone on the spot and say, give me your favorite Daredevil storyline. Now, give me your favorite Luke Cage storyline. How many people can come up with a Power Man slash Luke Cage storyline from the 70s or 80s? I, I don't know if I can. If I had enough time to think about it, maybe I could. But I can instantly say born again for Daredevil. I can instantly say anything Frank Miller did for Daredevil. I can instantly say, you know, is it Fall from Grace? I think it was. There's several Daredevil storylines, the the uh, the Kevin Smith run on Daredevil, Joe Casada. I mean, anything that several Daredevil things in the back of my head that I can instantly pull out and say, loved it, loved it, loved it. For Luke Cage, eh, not so much. But again, that's not to dismiss the writers that worked on Cage through the years in comic books. But Phil, do you think maybe that's one of the reasons why the Daredevil series kind of had was a, more successful because it kind of had a deeper well to draw from? Yeah, I definitely think that that's part of it. Um, Luke Cage was a very niche character for a long time. In some mm -hmm. people's eyes, he was a joke character until Bendis uh, made him a premier character and added him to the Avengers. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think that that's part of it. Because, um, I mean, I can't think of how many times I saw that uh, comic panel of uh, <laughs> Luke Cage busting into Liberia and uh, telling Doom he owes him money. Uh, <laughs> for a lot of people, he, uh, Luke Cage was just like a running joke. Yeah, that's fair. The way he was written for New was it um, New Avengers? Is what 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 when the, they split because of Civil War? Didn't they put him in New Avengers in the comics? Avengers. Yeah, fantastic. That the writing was you know it's Bendis, of course. Like, oh man, that run. I'm gonna have to go back and and binge that that run because. The dialogue between him and Spider Man and and dude, it's freaking great, man! It's so much fun. Yeah, but, uh, Luke Cage was essentially leader of that of that Avengers uh, group. He was. Uh, yeah. So Bendis did a lot to turn that character around. I mean, when you really look at the movies, the TV shows, uh, you can't understate how much Brian Bendis did for Marvel comics. Mm. Dude, there's there, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. I'll tell you, man, I, going back and watching this again, it just made me miss the Marvel Netflix shows straight up. It made me miss the shows. And because when they started canceling these things, guys, if you recall, it was one like the dominoes fell one by one. Remember, Marvel wasn't. I don't recall Marvel Netflix being very forthcoming about why they were doing this. Like, does anyone remember what the official story was, why they were because it, it kind of felt like they were being hush hush about it. What didn't they, or am I misremembering this? Yeah, I don't think they were ever really transparent about it. It seemed like um, one of those things where uh, Disney Plus was on the horizon, 
and I think Netflix was trying to fight to hold on to as many uh, intellectual properties as possible at the time. And I think people started to realize like a lot of Marvel stuff would end up under the Disney banner. And here we are. All of the Netflix shows are now on Disney Plus. Yeah, I know. Right. I mean, I'm glad they're she- I'm glad they're still here. I just I really wanted to see these shows keep going. I just I love that it was. It was yeah. like a look, you know, we always call it the, a, a corner of the MCU, right? So, yeah, if I if I had to guess, I, I assume it, it is the streaming rights thing. And mm. eventually they were going to start making their own um, IPs and their own TV shows for Disney Plus, which, of course, we eventually got because we've got the Disney Plus Marvel shows. And I have to assume that they wanted the rights to use those characters. And so. um Netflix probably was not going to wait around and basically do promotion for their streaming platform. They're just going to take all of the shows off the streaming platform. Wasn't it along the same time that Disney plus became a thing or am I getting that wrong too? Yeah. It was like around the same time. Cause um, if I remember correctly, didn't Marvel have a show or something on Hulu and like all of the shows started ending around the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They all went to Disney plus at that point. Yeah. But I heard there was rumors about the writers and the char- some of the main characters on Luke Cage wanting more money. Oh, but I think they all knew that if they had gone to to Disney Plus, like everybody else was, they were gonna you know clean up. And I think they just used that as like a uh, a way out, so to speak. But Netflix was smart. I wouldn't have kept that platform you know going or introduced you know uh, a new series when I know that you know. There is going to be taken over, well, not taken over, but having you know Disney Plus basically run that genre. Yeah. yeah, that's true. What about this? And I I pitched this in the beginning here, guys. What do you think about the idea of this being sort of uh, in its own little bubble and it's still feeling fresh and new? I mean, does everybody else get that same impression from this? Yeah, I like the idea that the Netflix show is all connected. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I agree with that. So let's talk about the guy. I want to talk. I, we, dude, there's so many fantastic actors in this cast. It is effing nuts. Mike Coulter is Luke Cage. I don't know if I knew Mike Coulter by name when he was cast as Luke Cage. I would say if you had reminded me of what he'd done, I could I could see him in my head. But I don't know if I could have known him by name. I pitched the question today on Reddit just as a sidebar of... Would you want to see Mike Coulter return as Luke Cage if and when the opportunity comes up? And 99% of the comments were a resounding yes. And a few people who were saying no start over. And I'm like, well, this you're a clown. Uh, <laughs> I'm just saying, he's freaking great. Ray, let me let me throw it to you here first. Tell me, in, in, in your opinion, why Mike Coulter and not The Rock or Terry Crews or you know, sort of a, a Ving Rhames or somebody, you know, big and jacked and, you or, know. Or Tyrese. Or Tyrese. <laughs> hey, you know, Leon could have played him if he was a pop singer. I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I, I had to slide that joke in there because Tyrese was uh, attached to the role for the longest when uh, uh, John Singleton was attached as director for the movie. That's very true. I Dude, I kind of forgot about that. What do you think, Ray? If you can't, I feel with any long series, you can't take the main character and replace him with somebody new because when you want to do flashback episodes, when you want to have like those episodes where they have to reminisce about a a certain evil villain or something, to have that face put in there, like it just looks weird. I don't know. Call me a stickler, but I feel like you've got to you've got to keep the main people. You know, it's one thing if, and I think I mentioned this in the beginning, if the series had only been a few episodes and, you know, it hadn't worked out and they replaced them, that's different. But the fact that he lasted throughout the entire series and now you're going to renew it and then take him out of it, it just seems weird. Yeah, he had, he had said as recently as January of this year that, because he's been asked about it, and full disclosure, kids, ever since these shows were canceled, pretty much every cast member of every show has said, I'd love to come back because everybody had so much fun. I don't think I don't think I heard one negative story from any cast member on any of these shows. This is the worst thing I ever did. It was horrible. I, I, I hated it. 
glad it's over. Not one person. They all wanted to come back. But Coulter was asked like in January of this year, and he's like, look, I'm in a really good place right now. I'm not going to focus too much on it. If the opportunity comes up, we'll talk. But right now I'm good. Now, of course, that was several months ago. We don't know what's happening now. I'd like to think maybe there's something going on behind the scenes. Phil, do you agree with Ray that, that number one, you don't recast him now, but number two, he was the perfect choice to begin with? Yeah, I thought he was a great choice. He was uh, definitely fit the role. Uh, this guy is massive. <laughs> so, mm. What, like 6'2", six, 6'3", six six uh, perfect uh, like physique and everything for the role. Um, I thought he... I thought he carried all of the quieter moments well in the role as well. He's a good actor as well. Um, mm-hmm. It wasn't like they just went and got some muscle head that could not act. Um, <laughs> and he was, I thought he was great. I thought he was a great guy to choose for a leading role. And I think if they do come back, I feel like he should. I mean, because um, I know he's done things before this, but this was really his claim to fame in a lot of ways. So it kind of be weird to go back to Luke Cage and not use him. Mm. It's true. I love that he said "Sweet Christmas" in the show. By the way, he does. I, I love that they gave a, a explanation for why he says "Sweet Christmas" as well. Yeah. Um. Yeah. All great stuff. I don't remember who introduced that explanation as to why he says "Sweet Christmas." Um. I'm not remembering that either. I know it's talked about in the, in the Bendis run on on Avengers. I know it's talked about a little bit in uh, Heroes for Hire. I just can't remember which one came first. And I also love, Ray, that by episode four, they put him in the, the TR in the yellow shirt with the chains. I loved it. Yes. hundred <laughs> percent. Oh, it was such a, such a great moment. For, listen, uh, we, we, as everybody knows, Marvel is one of the M's, right? Uh, we praise Marvel a bit, and I think it's richly deserved every time we do. This is one of the reasons I love Marvel is because they give fans little stuff that, you know, they give them a little morsels here and there and the only reason they do it is just to make you smile it's not they didn't have to do that they never had to put them in that they just did it to put a smile on your face and i freaking respect that yeah i thought it was a good moment yeah dude i think my culture pound for pound pun intended is the right guy for this and you know if you you know you want to do the math let's say they green light this how many years until we you know were to see him He's only getting older. That's the thing. So, you know, we got to we got to think about that too. Stays in shape, um stays healthy, right? Then, you know, if it's 5 years from now or whatever, hopefully not that long. I mean, we'll see. I I don't know. I would I would love to see him come back cuz as I said, I think he's a perfect choice here. As we all know, the the heroes are only as good as their rogues gallery and oh my god, does this guy have a rogues gallery season 1? Brother, you could have made season one and ended it, and I would have been okay with that, to be honest with you, because season one is great. Mahershala Ali as Cornell Cottonmouth Stokes. Ray, tell me, man, this this guy is so effing great. Why does he work so well on this show? His disposition, his mannerisms, his one-liners, like he he, he really gave you that gangster vibe that he was not fooling around like that. He was that person. And I don't know if you remember the episode where I think someone disobeyed him and he threw him off the roof. Yes. <laughs> and Ooh. he didn't blink. He was like, that's what you get for not answer, disrespecting me or for not listening or something like that. And I was like, wow. Like that character was just on another level. It was a shame him and Vincent D'Onofrio as the kingpin didn't cross paths. That would have been fun. That would have been fun to see a handshake between the two guys or something. He was intense. No, I love Kai. The, the character was just, it was just raw. Like he, he really went deep into that. And you, like I said, that episode just sticks with me. Like I said, I forgot if the guy didn't listen or shot the wrong person. He just, whatever it is, he didn't follow his order. And Next thing you know, he grabs him and just throws him off the roof. And I'm like, what the heck? It was his right-hand man who shot Pops. Yes, shot Pops. That's what happened. Yeah. And he just didn't even want to hear an apology or nothing. Gone. Wow. Like, he's not playing. This guy's for real. To be fair, Shades did try to tell him not to do it, but we'll get the Shades in a second. 
What do you think, Phil, about about Cottonmouth, man? Mahershala Ali, as we know, is Blade. We don't know when we're going to get him, but we're going to get him eventually. Dude, in my opinion, like if if I if I imagine myself walking into an acting class, I imagine this guy's on stage, and this is the guy you're going to follow his lead because he's that good. He just he's freaking brilliant in this show, man. What do you think about him here? He kind of stole the show a lot. Um, mm. And all, every scene he was in, he was really, really good. All all the way to the point that uh, when he's killed off, a lot of people started checking out on the show. I know a lot of people that didn't enjoy the show as much when he was gone. Mm. That's a great point. And uh, I think that, I mean, that, that leads us to the next heavy is Alfred Woodward, Woodard, excuse me, as Mariah Stokes. Black Mariah. Mariah Stokes Dillard. Two Nations Under Ted, a Ted Lasso podcast, tackles one of the most popular and critically acclaimed series of our time, bringing together three hosts from two different parts of the world. Two Nations reviews all three seasons of Ted Lasso, 34 episodes total with wrap-up episodes coming at the end of each season. Follow the show on social media at Two Nations Pod, and be sure to subscribe and download on all the major platforms. Just look us up, Two Nations Podcast. I think that they tempered each other, Phil. They tempered each other. They were the A and B. They were the left and right. And when you kill him off, she's very good. She's a great actress. She's exceptional here. But it did, for me, kind of feel like her character goes off the rails to the point of maybe this isn't as believable as it was when Cottonmouth was still around. Does that make sense to anybody? Does that, did anybody get that same feeling from this or no? Yeah, I think... Uh... Kaiden mouth worked because he wasn't as um like kitsch and like comic booky. Yes. Um and I think once you make uh Mariah and later Diamond back the main villains of the show, they're both very over the top in in comparison to Cotton Mouth. Mm. Yeah. God dude, very, very well said. Yeah, very comic booky. Ray, did you get that feeling too, or did you think that she was perfect as the villain even without Cotton Mouth? I think it was like good, but it was like almost like kind of forced. She didn't seem like that type of person. It was like you had to pull it out of her to have her come across, you know, as this you know evil politician who's now, you know, gone to the other side. Because initially she was, you know, against Cottonmouth. She didn't like what he was doing. She was like, okay, you can do this, but you know, I don't want to be involved in this. But as obviously you know, time progressed, she got more and more into you know that side of the business and. She kind of flipped script, but mm-hmm. I, I didn't like her as much as Cottonmouth. No, yeah, I thought she was good. I thought she she was she was good in the role, mm-hmm. but I can see why people kind of checked out because uh, Cottonmouth was so much more compelling and he was so much more interesting. Um, that once he was gone, it was like, well, man, that was kind of a show for me. <laughs> yeah, well, and plus. We had we had the rise of Theo Rossi as Shades, and it became the Shades and Mariah show after that, like to a large degree because it was them versus Cage or whatever. And like, uh, yeah, can we all just like give Theo Rossi his flowers and say he is the perfect, brutal, cold hearted, sadistic henchman that we would want forget comic book show in any type of show of this nature, right? Isn't this guy just effing perfect? He's perfect. He's perfect. Plays his part. Like his attitude, disposition, mannerisms are all spot on. Like he was an excellent, uh, excellent character. Loved him a lot too. I was a little when he was involved with Mariah romantically, but you know, I got over it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you kind of have to, or you're going to be not watching. So yeah. Phil, same opinion? Yeah, I think Shades is a good character. I think that uh, he gets a little bit more to do in season two that's interesting, but mm-hmm. I, I enjoyed him. Um, but yeah, I it, I just think that Cotton Mouth casts such a large shadow over everybody. I mean, the fact that they kept everything running out of the same nightclub and it was just still, it just still seems like, yeah, Cotton Mouth should be here. And they kept doing, redoing the... Um, the visual of somebody standing in front of the Biggie, Biggie Smalls painting mm. with the crown over their head. And I'm like, yeah, but Cottonmouth made this look cool. And now everybody's like now trying to do it. And it's like, uh, and I think, no matter of fact, didn't they replace it with a Basquiat or something later in the season? I think you're right. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. 
I love that painting of Biggie, man. When when Cottonmouth is he keeps stepping forward to the point that the crown is over his head. That is freaking great stuff. That's great stuff. Is anybody here a, a um Sons of Anarchy fan? Isn't that where Rossi came from to this show? Or am I, I wrong? I think so. Yeah. I think yeah. so. I think so too. I never got into that show, man. I I don't I don't know. There was something you know, here we are talking about a a, a show where the main character has like you know, his skin's like steel and, and like dudes are breaking their fists. Amazing scene, by the way, on his jaw. And I, I don't, I'm okay with that, but I'm not okay with the show where there's a biker gang in broad daylight running a town and cops never seem to care <laughs> that they're killing people. That part bothers me, but not the comic book stuff. So like, all right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's my mini rant on uh, Sons of Anarchy. He's great, man. And you know, there are moments, no disrespect to the rest of these, these actors, these fine actors, but there are moments when the, the trinity of Cottonmouth, Mariah, and Shades, man, they are whew, they're crushing it independently and together when they share this, the camera. And it's you know, there's moments when I'm like, man, whew, it's, this is starting to feel like a villain show, dude. Like it's They're just so good, man. They just chew up the scenery when they're on the camera together, man. Yeah, agreed. Great stuff. Well, we can't just talk all about the villains and fawn over them all day, kids. Let's talk about Simone Missick as Mercedes Misty Knight. Ray, what's your what's your take on this? From the way she hooked up with Cage and and lied to him, didn't tell him the truth about what about who she is, to the fact that she becomes such a a hard edge and and no nonsense cop man. What do you think about her in this role? I really thought in the beginning. She was going to build a, a romantic relationship with Luke because obviously, you know, that a little, little trisk. Mm-hmm. But but then all of a sudden she just became more of like, you know, this like leader of the police squad. And, you know, she was trying to, you know, stop, you know, all the stuff from going on, you know, stop Cottonmouth and all his uh, all his business endeavors, so to speak. But I liked her. I liked her as a character. Um, like I said, it threw, it threw me a curveball in the beginning because I thought. Like those two were going to end up, you know, as an item, so to speak. But that, they, they kind of like, I don't know if they thought of the idea and then said, no, nah, let's just kind of keep it platonic or I don't know. Like that part kind of confused me a little bit in the beginning. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, the two had the chemistry. She didn't tell them who she was, like you said. And then next thing you know, they're having their little tryst. And then it's like it, almost like it didn't happen. Are they better separate or together? What do you think? Well, I'm a uh, what's her what's the woman's name? Rosario. Uh, Rosario Dawson, yeah. Or a Dawson fan, so that's not fair to me to answer that question. <laughs> that's fair. So yeah. yeah, I mean, if she wasn't a character on the show, yeah. But once they brought her on, I was like, okay, I'd rather be I'd rather him be with her anyway. Yeah, that's true. But just the dynamics of the three of them were kind of interesting. Mercedes, one of the daughters of the dragon, along with Colleen Wing, who comes to the show. She comes in season two, yes? Colleen Wing, yes. Yeah, 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 I thought so. I, I do think that, and I like Jessica Henwick a lot as Colleen Wing, but I do think that Simone Missick is uh, maybe a, that much better than her to some regard. Like, I don't I don't know why I get that feeling, but it's... I just I don't know. You can kind of tell when the, when the actor is really really crushing it, and they're very good at what they're doing. But again, I don't dislike Jessica at all. I think she's uh, I think she's just fine in her role, and uh, I think the two of them together were pretty good. What uh, Phil? What's what's your thoughts on Mercedes Misty Knight compared to the way she was written in the books, the way she was fleshed out in the show? I mean, being portrayed as a as a you know, like I said, hard edge, but, you know, strong and very confident cop and, and doing her thing. What did you think about her here? I thought she was one of the breakout characters from the show. I thought mm, that they yeah. could have easily done a spinoff with Misty and I would have been in on it because uh, she was that good in the show. Um, I love the dynamic between her and Luke. I love that they established the coffee running gag that ends up going on for the entirety of the series. Mm-hmm. Um, uh I don't know if it's just me, but I also thought that uh, the Iron Fist characters benefited from being from, on Luke Cage season two because I enjoyed them more in Luke Cage. I even enjoyed uh, Finn more as Iron Fist and Luke Cage. Like, 
I think when he shows up for the few episodes and they have like their team up in that episode, yeah. and he has the jacket on with Hero for Hire on the back of it. I really enjoyed it. And I was like, all right, well, I'd be in for seeing more of him and Finn together if it means like a Heroes for Hire show. But um, that first season of Iron Fist wasn't really it. Season two of Iron Fist is much better than season one. It is. But I think at that point, the show already left a bad taste in people's mouth and they yeah, just right. wouldn't give it a chance. And it, the relationship between him and Cage, you have to nail it. Yes. Like, you know what I mean? Like, dudes my age and older are going to be sitting there with their arms crossed going, all right, all right, let's see. And they freaking nailed it. The, the two of them together are hilarious. Like, I really yeah. enjoyed every time they were on screen together. Yeah, I, I thought that uh they were much better together than uh, Finn was um, on his own as, as uh, Iron Fist. Mm. But... Yeah, I thought uh I thought Misty Knight was great here. I thought it was great in season two when we do get the we do get the robotic arm and everything. Um I thought she was really great in the show and I thought one of the big shames of this series is that we got such a good cliffhanger with her and Luke at the end of season two and we didn't get we didn't get a follow up. Mm, that's fair. Speaking of strong female leads, uh Ray, you mentioned her earlier, Rosario Dawson is Claire Temple. The night nurse, right? Mm -hmm. She is the Coulson of the Marvel Netflix shows because she pops up (laughs) everywhere and she's very entertaining and she's a really good actor. And man, she humanizes every show here and especially Luke Cage. I don't think there's much that that Rosario Dawson can't do, Ray, honestly. No. She was awesome on that show. And she she brought the human character and the human element out of him. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and I think, you know, she brought out his, you know, vulnerable side and she was, she was awesome. I liked her character a lot. I mean, she was, let's say, probably a better match for him because you didn't have to worry about the, the implications of a detective, you know, Misty Knight being involved and that, that puts her job in jeopardy, puts her life in jeopardy to a large degree, being involved with a superhero. It does for Rosario also. But again, she doesn't have the added pressure of being a cop as well. So I guess that's a bit of stickiness they managed to avoid there. 100%. Yeah, I had forgotten. I'll be honest with you guys, man. I started binging this show again in preparation for this episode, and I had forgotten quite a bit of this stuff. And again, as I said at the intro, how much fun this show is to watch, man. Let's talk, and we'll jump back to the cast here in a second because there's a few people we hadn't mentioned yet. Let's talk about the vibe of this show. Very, I, I swear you could have set this in the 70s, and, and if you had told me, if you'd run it along the bottom of the screen you know, Harlem, New York, 1977. I would have said, all right, cool, you're right. Or 75 or whatever. It just fits. Phil, everything I see feels old school. Everything feels vintage. It feels retro. I They don't, unless I'm just not remembering clearly enough, I don't remember being choked with technology. And it's very scaled down. It's, you know, just looks like real people living their real lives. But, dude, the look and and feel of the show, the texture and the vibe is just great. I love it so much. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're dead on that it very much feels like a black exploitation film as a TV show. Mm. Uh, it has the vibe from the theme song to just like um, the kind of stories they're telling, the, the atmosphere they're trying to create in Harlem. Um, I love that they made sure to make it feel like Harlem. They weren't just like, oh, well, let's just have... Luke Cage in New York. They made sure that it was in Harlem and they kind of uh, develop Harlem into its own kind of distinct character for the show. And I think that helped. But I think the all it's also um, before. Well, no, because this came out. I was going to say this was uh, this was arguably the blackest Marvel property. But no, this came out. Um, 2016, right? Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. So that actually was was this the same year as Black Panther came out? I didn't think Black Panther was back that far, but you might be right. Why was I thinking Black Panther was 2018, 2019? Not 2019. I think it was the same but, uh, year. 2018, maybe. Is it was the same year or uh, Black Panther came out the year before? I think it was the Black same Black Panther year. was 2018. Oh. Yeah. Well, there you go. Up to that point, it was the blackest Marvel franchise. Um, outside of the comics because uh, not just like the feel of it, the music, um, the fact that it was set in Harlem, um, mm. the director, 
um, the fact that they made sure to bring in as many notable names from other shows that um, if you watch other like black TV shows, you're like, oh, that's this person from The Wire. That's this that, this person from here. Um, I think that's part of what made this show so good. Mm. Mm, that's fair. Yeah. This feels like a 70s cop drama, Ray. Do, do you get that vibe, too, when you watch this show? Yeah, it definitely had like that 70s flair and they didn't have a like you said a lot of like the modern technology that they used. I mean, you know, they really if they did, they really didn't bring it up a lot like I know that, you know, uh they you know had an old school barbershop and you know, all the bands that performed on the show, you know, had like a, that 70s vibe, that 70s feel. There wasn't oh, anything yeah. there that you could have said Hey, you know, this is, you know, 2016. Right. And by the way, guys, the the music in in Harlem's Paradise is (laughs) freaking phenomenal. Like, insane. Like, you would hope that all these real life people don't know they're in the, the, the building of a freaking gangster who's a murderous SOB. But man, it's great stuff, dude. It's awesome. I love it so much. Yeah, it definitely reminded me of New York Undercover in a lot of ways as well. Mm-hmm. Like the the whole like music artist of the week thing, it it felt very much like New York Undercover. Switching gears for a sec, did they kill Pops too early for you? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's one thing I I would have said too. I would have kept Pops around a little longer because he was like Luke's like you know mentor and like guiding him to like do the right thing and. You know, use your powers for good and this, that, and the other. And it killed him a little too soon. He was a great character. I liked him a lot. He was his Obi-Wan, right? Yeah, he was. And, you know, <laughs> his presence was there. I know, like, two of the barbers were fighting, and he got those two guys to make peace. And, like, he was the guy, who, you know. And he could have had a much more prevalent role in the show if they kept him along a little longer. See, that that's... I didn't want to jade anybody's opinion but with my own, but that was... I didn't remember it being that early. It was episode two, right? I just didn't remember it happening that early. Phil, did you think it was on time for the story or could you have, have waited a few more for that happened? I mean, you could have kept him around longer. I think his, his purpose was to essentially be his Obi-Wan, his Uncle Ben, his uh, his motivating uh, force and to give him the catchphrase for the rest of the show. Mm-hmm. Um I it didn't really bother me that he died in the second episode. I really liked that the show focuses around the barber shop as well, and that's kind of like his like quote unquote base of operations. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. It's great because it keeps it it keeps it small. Like they reference the battle for New York here, and you don't really ever see the cleanup, but they allude to it quite a bit. They talk about the cleanup, right? So you know, after seeing all that. Again, this goes back to the technology reference too. Then you get it, you get it pared back down and and you know scaled down to where it's just again, dude. These feel this feels like normal people living normal lives. None of this, yeah, the gangster stuff can be over the top. Of course, the powers are over the top. I've, I mean, no, no kidding. But I don't know, dude. It just feels like a real show, man. I, again, I love that Marvel will give you the one-two punch of. We're going to give you the, you know, the big, the spectacle and the the gravitas of, a, of an Avengers film on the big screen. And then we're going to give you this and you're going to love this just as much because we've got the right story writers in place and the actors are crushing it. I, I just I love every dimension of the shows that I'm seeing here, man, for sure. The Defenders. We talked about Finn Jones as Danny Rand slash Iron Fist and Finn Jones's defense. I will go on the record. Be on the record before Finn Jones did had like no time to prepare. That was what was being told. I don't know if he was cast late in the process. I suspect that he was. But the fight scenes, if you go back and look at them, kids, they are they're rough. Okay, yeah. he's right. If he's seen the the slow down and he's missing the punch by a country mile, it doesn't even come close to the stunt man's face. And you're yeah. like, oh, this is bad, dude. Yeah, th- there are good things about that. Like Steel Serpent, the guy that played Davos was very good. I thought mm. he was a better fighter in many ways. Like his choreography was good. The episode where they had the drunken master was also really good. That fight is really good as well. But yeah, definitely. You could tell that uh, he was not 
uh, prepared for this role. <laughs> he was very ill prepared. <laughs> yeah. And he, you know, he took it on the chin. I remember him being very, uh, he was cool about it. He never lashed out at fans when, when he could have. People were acting like D-bags to him, and he didn't do that to anybody else. And, you know, I always thought it was a class act, which I think saved his, saved face for him with a lot of fans. And it should have, because, you know, again, he was just placed in a situation, in my opinion, where he just didn't have enough time to prepare. But I do love him and Cage together. Uh, Ray, if things had been different, and it's not too late. I mean, everybody's still young enough to make this happen. Would you be down for a you know a Power Man and Iron Fist project of some of some type somewhere? Hundred percent. I mean, Iron Fist was really great on the show. Um, I think his solo project show didn't. I don't know. Some about just came very stale, and mm. I feel like there were some fight scenes with him and Luke that were really good. Um, and I don't know. Those two seem to click pretty well on the show. Yeah, he's better in Defenders as well. Now that I think about yes. it, yes, yes, he is very much is. I remember him, but kind of being the comic relief of that show too, wasn't he? Didn't he have a lot of great one-liners in that show? Yeah, he was. He was just better all around in in other shows outside of his own show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, right. weird. Like, he was really good in everything else but his own show. Like, well, they made a lot about that family too, the brother and the sister. Yeah, they made the a lot Meachums. about them. Yes, the Meachums. God, I forgot all about that name. The whole freaking Iron, Iron Fist series was about the brother and the sister. Tom Clark 6M Podcast is sponsored in part by Radius Law Group. Every day, Radius helps individuals, families, small businesses, and nonprofit organizations throughout North Carolina, Florida, and Pennsylvania resolve their legal issues by providing effective legal counsel in the areas of estate planning as well as elder law and Medicaid. Radius Law holds the radical belief that working with a lawyer can indeed be enjoyable. So give them a call at 1-800-519-5667 for more information and tell them that Tom Clark 6M Podcast sent you. I do like that the brother came around by season two. I actually love the idea of him and Danny working together. That was pretty cool, actually. I was here for that. Yeah. I do think he worked a lot better for Iron Fist. Uh, Phil, why do you think that is? Do you think it, I mean, the writing, of course, but is it comfort level maybe that he's not the 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 starring, you know, center of the show, he can maybe relax a bit. Do you think it's a combination of all that? Yeah, I think that's part of it, but I think that the expectations for Iron Fist were very high because this was the first uh, adaptation we were getting of Iron Fist. It was kind of a lofty uh, project to try and take on with a TV budget because mm-hmm. um, we did never see the dragon. We didn't see any of Kunlun. Which I'm like, you can't do an Iron Fist show and not give us any of those things. I remember everybody being upset because it wasn't an Asian actor that was cast. And I'm thinking. I mean, Danny's white. Danny's white. Number one, Danny's white. Number two, don't you think it's a bit on the nose to cast an Asian actor in the role of a Kung Fu guy? Like, Uh, yeah, I mean, (laughs) I understand how you can use an Asian in the role, but, um, a big part of Danny's character is that he's white and his aloofness a part of it is because he's white. Fair. Yeah. I don't know. Like Sean Chi's a different property. You can't cast a white guy as Sean Chi. That's utterly ridiculous. Yeah, no. That makes no sense. It doesn't fit. You yeah, know, that would have been horrible. Yeah. So a couple of other cast members that I really want to get to here, Mustafa Shakir as Bushmaster. I had to jump to him, man. Cause I don't know if you guys have checked out the Cowboy Bebop show. They got canceled after one season because Netflix sucks. But he was great in that show. I'm going to be honest with you. But, Ray, what uh, what's your what's your thoughts on him as Bushmaster here, man? What do you think about that? Dim called him Bushmaster. Yes. My favorite character on the show. Other than Luke himself, Bushmaster, in my opinion, he was... In, he was incredible. That whole vibe, the whole Jamaican vibe with 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 his click and how he, you know, just took over and, and he stabbed his brother in the eye. Yeah, it was crazy. Like that that character was top notch. I loved Bushmaster. Uh, I, Ray, I don't know if you're a Bebop fan, but if you're not, you need to check him out as Jet Black and Cowboy Bebop. He's great. I have to watch this now. He's great. 
Yeah. If you're not a fan of the anime, you'll probably be okay. Because if you're a fan <laughs> of the anime, you'll go in with different set of expectations. But if you're not and you haven't seen it, you you may just freaking love it. I enjoyed the show quite a bit, and I'm already a fan of the property going in. I didn't understand where a lot of the hate was coming from, but look, people can be goofy. So, uh, yeah, I recommend it. He's great here. Again, Phil, this is back to the idea of Marvel has a penchant of casting the right actors in the right roles. Shakir is another example here, man. He's really good. Yeah, I enjoyed him. Um, uh, he does the capoeira throughout the show. Um, I yeah. think the way, <laughs> I think his fighting style, like the way he talks and everything is great. Um, like his his whole uh, presence on the show is great. Um, he has that fight with Luke on the bridge and doesn't he like chuck him off the side of the bridge? <laughs> I the think fight? so, yeah. <laughs> he, he does full on um, rock Austin on him, throws him off a bridge. What was the stuff he would take to give him those powers? It was like um, a leaf from a plant. I think so. It had a kind of a very Black Panther vibe to it, didn't it? Like the herb? The girl's daughter, she had like a little shop of like natural medicines. Mm, that's right. And he needed that certain, it was like a root or like a plant that gave him his powers. Phil, you got to remember this. I remember, I remember that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember what it was called, though. It's coming back to me. You're right. I too, Again, I had totally forgotten about that, man. Yeah, um, good call. I can't. Oh my god! I know what would... you're talking about. I forget. Yeah. I forget what it was called though. Uh, he uses folk magic to gain powers almost equal to cages. Yeah, and he could take bullets. Like you could shoot him and didn't do anything because he had that that special root palette that it was. I forgot what it was. Red. Mm. Oh my god! I'm gonna have to I'll have to go to Netflix and find the Netflix <laughs> box. So on one hand, you got Mustafa Shakir as Bushmaster. On the other hand, you have. Eric LeRae Harvey as Diamondback. So who do we like better, Bushmaster or Diamondback? Oh, Bushmaster. Bushmaster by a mile. Bushmaster. <laughs> um, and, I, and I don't mind Diamond. Um, I don't mind Diamondback. I know some people felt like he was too cartoony. Um, I enjoyed him. I think the first fight he has with Luke, um, and like I said, they have the the music that plays over it's great. Um, I think the way I think some of his one liners and his uh, over the top. <laughs> <laughs> mannerisms are also enjoyable as well, but I can see why people don't enjoy him as much as some of the other villains. I mean, you know, again, if, if your villains are all over the top and not believable, it's going to cause people to detach from the show and they're not going to enjoy it as much maybe as they could have, or is this going to be the point where you just, you notice it so much that it's distracting. I think they had just amount, just perfect amount of levels of this throughout this show I didn't really find myself getting distracted by a whole lot of anything. Rewatching season one again. That's me though. Did anybody get really taken out? Can you recall a moment when you really got taken out of the, of the show and you're kind of shaking your head wanting it, wanting that scene to pass. Cause I, I don't personally remember me having a moment like that. That diamondback suit was, I don't know. I'm sorry. I thought it was a little too cartoonish and cheesy. <laughs> That's fair. I just, I just, I couldn't get into it. Uh, and then it was called nightshade. Nightshade. Well done. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna go. To, I'm not gonna sleep, Tom. I'm like you. If I don't remember what that thing was, I'll forget it. My whole oh, night's gonna. Man. It was nightshade, and that makes the character more realistic. He needed that to, you know, battle Luke. Yeah, for sure. And you know, we we make the newest guy on the show do some research. So I'm glad you were able to find that in time. So I have to. <laughs> I'm the new guy, dude. That's my job. I'm telling you. Yeah, I, I liked I liked Diamondback's backstory with Luke, and I liked everything they did with um, their relationship. Um, but I can again, I can understand why people are like this is this is a little hokey. Yeah, I mean, I I got moments. I mean, small moments of that, but I don't work. I don't know. Maybe it's because I haven't binged the entire show um, in a while. Maybe that's maybe that's why. But I just, I don't know, man. I just felt like everybody was cast here. Turk, we got to give Turk a shout out, who's, you know, historically a Daredevil character and did appear on the Daredevil series. Did Turk appear on, I know he, he was on Daredevil and I know he's in Luke Cage. Was he in Defenders as well? I believe he is in Defenders. I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure he was. Um, yeah, Turk is great. Um, Turk is a great, uh, like, <laughs> 
very like uh, if if you know you know Daredevil character from the comics, and I was yes. super excited to see him in the show, and uh, they cast him perfectly. Um, he's really funny in Daredevil, also very funny in uh, <laughs> Luke Cage uh, when he gives the line of "Man, I'm gonna go back to Hell's Kitchen where it's safe." Yes, <laughs> amazing <laughs> line, still very funny. <laughs> Oh, it's great. That's great. That was after Cottonmouth threw the guy off the roof. Yeah, that was awesome. That is Rob Morgan as Turk Barrett. He is fantastic. And you're right what you said. Turk in the books is just, uh, no one's safe. No one's safe. Whatever it takes to save his own skin, he'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Oh, my God. So good. Yeah. The cast is huge, man. If you really start going down the list of all of like both seasons, it's big. It's big. What about the backstory um, with with Mariah and Cottonmouth? Ray, what's your thoughts on on was it uh, was it uh, uh, Mama Mabel? I think yeah, and all that was all. Did all that work for you pretty much or no? It, it worked. I mean, you know, she. I know that she was trying to, you know, distinguish herself from not being called a Stoke. She was a Dillard. Mm. I know that was like her hot button and like she was like, Don't call me a Stoke because, you know, the Stokes were into doing all that illegal stuff and you know, I'm high class, I'm a Dillard. But then as, you know, when Cottonmouth died and she kinda took over that regime, then she more embraced that evil side of her. Mm, yeah. And then she was like, Don't call me Dillard, it's Stokes. So I know that um when her and Bushmaster were going at it. You know, he was teasing her and calling her Stokes and she was fighting it. And then she like I said, kind of embraced it. Yeah, boy, she came into her own, didn't she? Didn't she come into her own as just a vile, despicable person? Oh, yeah. Like she just completely did a 180 and like just embraced that evil character now. And she was like, I'm in charge now. Well, you know, she she already didn't have problem taking blood money taking pay off. She was okay with all that. She was okay with being a criminal to a degree, but she called it something else. And Phil, she kept making comments in season one, like, if we're going to do this, we have to do it the right way. But then she would go meet people and talk to them and then need sanitizer to, to clean her hands. Like, she was, she didn't really have a prayer of being legit, Phil, did she? Didn't she? Wasn't she always headed in the wrong direction here? Yeah. Yeah. It, it sure seemed like it. Um, I mean, you know, I know it's a polarizing decision to kill off Cottonmouth, but um, I remember that episode where we got that cliffhanger where she kills Cottonmouth in the club with the mic stand, and I was, like, sitting there, like, in silence looking at the screen after that happened. Like, that that really happened, huh? It's like, she just, like, really, like, beat this man to death. <laughs> I did not see that coming. I had heard nothing and didn't know anything and then watched it, and I'm like, what? <laughs> like... <laughs> What was yeah. he teasing her about that caused her to snap? I forgot. Oh, I'm blanking on that as well. I don't remember. I forgot what he was teasing her about, but it I, it was something from their childhood. I know that uh, uh, she's based off of the Luke Cage character, Black Mariah, and of course you're not going to call this woman Black Mariah <laughs> in, in, in 2016. So, of course, they did like alterations to the character. And so I'm pretty sure the Black Mariah name comes up at, at points in the show. Yeah. as a joke, but I can't remember if that's what Cottonmouth was teasing her about. Yeah, I don't remember. I know it was something about their childhood, but I forgot what it was, too. But she snapped. Shades is there to clean up the mess, isn't he? Yeah, he jumps in right away and cleans up that mess. Yeah, he jumps right in. And that's when those two kind of form like a, a bond, you know, and oh, inter romantic at that point. Oh, yeah, they bonded for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got to be honest with you guys. It's not the age that got me. Nothing really got me that made me think, eh. But when that happened, I thought, eh, I don't know. I don't know. It's something about that felt like, like she's on this level. He's on this level. Would they really, eh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. For me, I kind of could have done without that angle, honestly. Yeah. You didn't buy into, uh, as soon as it was over, he slid into the room and it just, uh, all of a sudden, you can hear Elton John in the background. Can you feel? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> uh, no. No. And, and he was playing her the whole time, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, he was an opportunistic the entire show. Yeah. Ooh. 
Yeah. See, again, a lot of this is it's lost in time. When I say time, I mean a few years because it has been that long. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's coming back to me. Uh, we did not mention Frank Whaley as Detective Raphael Scarf. This guy is good in everything he's in. And no matter who or what he plays, he's 100% believable. The guy seems like he's been acting for 50 years, and he's not even that old, probably. He's been in everything, it feels like. He's very good. Great cop. Did you see him being heel? Did anybody see that coming? I did not. I definitely didn't. And then when I thought, when I think it was at one point, kind of mouth went to talk to somebody about, you know, getting his guns or getting his drugs or whatever. And then he turns around and he's the guy. I'm like, what? That blew my mind. I was like, oh, my God, he's he's on his side. Okay. Yeah. You just about got to have a dirty cop, right? You got to have at least one, don't you? Yeah, you yeah. have to. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, it's something you got to do. Yeah. He's, uh, yeah, I, I thought he was great. I mean, everything he did. It seemed like, if I'm remembering correctly, he... They they gave him something of a redemption arc. Wasn't he like regretting decisions by the end of his life on this show? I think. Yes, it's been a while since I've seen season two, but I remember he had a little bit of a redemption arc. Um, but I mean, they had done so much world building, like they had like mm. built like so much around like the police station. Who's the other captain's name or the other superior that uh? Misty oh my God! The, some oh, that was romantically involved with um, Mariah. Two of them had the child. Oh man, I've blanked on that entirely. Yeah, she, she had the. She had the. They had, like her daughter is a big part of season two. That's right. That's right. See, it'll come back eventually. <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm thinking, wasn't there like a female captain that she reported to? Because I remember at one point, like, didn't she like ski wee or something like that? And she like she was like, you gonna ski wee up in here? <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I forgot who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. an Inspector Priscilla Ridley. Yeah, maybe that's it. Wait. Karen Pittman. Yeah, you go ski we on up in here. We <laughs> all <laughs> I remember that. That's a great line. Captain Tom Ridenour, I think, is the guy we were thinking of, played by Peter yeah. J. Fernandez. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're. Th- you're I'm thinking of uh, uh, Priscilla Ridley. Was she like a deputy or something? She was uh, Inspector Priscilla Ridley. That's all I've got on her. Yeah. She didn't last long. Yeah, could have been. I mean, you said it right, Phil, when you said world building. It's, it's, you know, it's important because the world needs to feel lived in. When this show starts, this world feels lived in. I mean, it's important. You can, you know, it's it's like when, when the, the coat of paint's still fresh on the set and people look like they don't belong and the cast has no synergy and and people are miscast you're like yeah i'm not feeling this which is why i think a lot of properties fail ultimately but this Mm -hmm. world feels lived in from episode one doesn't it yeah let's see we've also got justin swain as detective mark bailey he's in 15 episodes we've got bobby fish portrayed by ron cephas jones where's the lie (laughs) <laughs> where is the lie indeed the and lie? by the way he's great If and he's the character in the barber shop that's playing chess yeah Ron Cephas has been like everywhere this guy has been acting for a minute he's had a ton of roles um, did you know he's passed I didn't know this I did know that um, August 19th yeah I did know that he passed recently Looks kind of like Obi-Wan Kenobi yeah, he sort of had that mentor vibe to him. Great look too. Just that look like the wise old man. You know what I mean? Just like a look like a beatnik that that like came, kind of came into his age and he still held on to who he was before. Like that's what I get from his look. You know? Yeah, but yeah, he's been around forever. He's been in uh, tons of TV shows. He's in um, he's in Paid in Full. If you've ever seen that movie, mm. classic movie. It's been all. It's been all over. Sean Ringgold is Sugar. We didn't mention Sugar. Jaden Kane is Zip. Thomas Jones as Comanche. By the way, if you're going to have a nickname, it needs to be Comanche. That's a great nickname. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a great nickname. Just so oh many my great God. characters in the show. Uh, yeah. Doesn't uh, 
Reggie Cathy is in this show as well. He's been in tons of shows as well, tons of movies. I believe Reg is also passed, didn't he? Um, yeah. maybe. Reg, because I he passed uh like maybe two years ago. Oh wow, two or three, something like that. Reg Cathy as James Lucas for seven episodes, February ninth, twenty eighteen. Yeah, but yeah, he's another one, a uh, uh, a Wire alum. He was also in a bunch mm. of TV shows, a bunch of movies. Mm -hmm. Um, he's been all over the place. Uh, and so he's one of those guys. The second you see him on screen for this show, it's like ah, it's, it's Reg. He's been everywhere. So we talked about you know whether or not Coulter should come back if he'd want to come back, if he can come back, if the money's right. By the way, pay the man. Hey, hey, Tom Clark here for Tom Clark's main event. And if you are not subscribed, you're doing life wrong. Going strong since 2014 with over 300 episodes and a variety of guests that include Randy Orton, The Big Show, Rob Van Dam, and a lot more. Check us out on all the major platforms, including YouTube at Boink Studios. Subscribe today, Tom Clark's main event. Let's say we get something up and running. Ray, if it's you, do you pick up where season two ends? Do you start fresh? Do you continue the story they began? Do you do a new story? I mean, if it's you behind a new Luke Cage series with Mike Culture, what do you do? I think that you kind of build off the ending of season two, but start some other, you know, other characters, maybe, you know, bring in some new characters. But I don't think Bushmaster, like, complete i don't think bushmaster was completely written off the show at the end he would kind of like kind of like went his own way but you know you could still technically bring him back because he wasn't killed off the show mm. that's a good point good point phil do you start fresh or do you do you continue what you were doing before oh man they had such a good um cliffhanger to season two mm. i would hate it if they didn't try and go back that in some ways uh, it's a very daredevil cliffhanger as well. Like the idea is that uh, Luke looked around and was like, this is never going to end. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be the head of this. I'm going to, this is my nightclub now, which is essentially what daredevil did. in Bendis' run when he beat down the Kingpin and then he declared that I'm the Kingpin of crime now. Um, very similar. Um, I'm sure that was not an accident. I, uh, I was turned off by that last episode because I, th in my head, I thought this character would never do this. This character would never set himself up like this. It just, it just wouldn't happen. He wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't do this. You didn't like the cliffhanger. They even did like the Godfather of him closing the door. I couldn't wait to see where it was going to go. But again, for me, I'm like, this is out of character. I don't know if I'm feeling this. I love the twist. I love the idea of the twist. All right. I love the idea of the twist. But seeing the twist executed turned me off, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, uh, I think there was so much potential for stuff they could have done in season two with him running around in like a suit with maybe like a yellow shirt under it, kind of like the same design that they did for the Heroes for Hire uh, mm. uh, comic that was like a few years old was like, uh, I know Sanford Green designed that look for it. Um, but I really like the idea of him like trying to earnestly uh, solve things from that side and thinking that he's doing the right thing. Um, of course, it was not going to work and it's going to blow up in his face. But um, I really like that 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 concept. And I think they could have done something really cool with season three. Ray, so let's don't forget in the books, Luke Cage and Jessica Jones are together. Yep. Do you do you do that? here and just say hey let's let's go with the books let's put them together do you do that here or no I, I wouldn't be upset if you did because a lot of the story from the series came right out of the book mm -hmm. so you know it wouldn't make sense and i did like that ending like the way he closed the doors i was just like the godfather like that was a great ending in my opinion so you bring it back in my opinion and you like i said see how he you know, tries to work that side of, of, you know, the law, working, you know, as the head kingpin, so to speak. But, yeah, you got to bring her back. You got to bring her into the mix at some point. Maybe you bring her in to find out what the F's going on and why he did it to begin with. Yeah. 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 And, I mean, I, I think in order for him 
for, in order for Luke Cage to work ahead of any of the Avengers stuff he did, he always worked kind of outside of the law in some ways. Mm. Um, and so I wouldn't mind him, like I said, doing like the hero for hire stuff or like doing similar stuff out of that nightclub. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I mean, if if it's used as a plot device and it gets Jessica Jones in the mix and we get to see her and get to see them, because I'll be honest with you, I'm a fan of those two together. Even though they, you take one look at the way the relationship is written, like these two are kill each other. Like it's a terrible idea. Like I don't know. I like that she's bad and dangerous and she's tough and unpredictable. And I don't know. I kind of felt like at their best, they were pretty fun and awesome together. So yeah. You know, yeah, I'd love yeah. to say that actually. Yeah, Kristen Ritter was perfect casting for Jessica Jones. Gosh, like, she's you, so good. Perfect casting. You couldn't have cast anyone better. I mean, there's, they're just, yeah, no, nah, dude, she's, oh my god, we're gonna do a Jessica Jones episode now. She, uh, she's freaking great, man. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally believe that Jessica Jones and those novels before Avengers were some of um, Bendis's best work. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah Alias yeah, I is. Did. I think Alias is some of his best work. I know that they couldn't just call the show Alias because they didn't want to confuse it with the Jennifer Gardner show. But sure, Alias is really some of Bendis's best work. Plus, they call it Alias. You know, you'd have tuned in expected the acting to not be that great. We didn't want that. <laughs> I'm just not a Jennifer Garner guy, man. I'm sorry. It's not. I mean. She did other great things outside of that terrible Daredevil movie that we don't have to speak about. Um, I thought we agreed to never speak about it. <laughs> yeah, but she did other great things. Supposedly, she's supposed to show up in this uh, uh, Deadpool movie um, so, along with other Fox characters. Haven't they already dismissed that, or is that just a way for them to throw you off the trail? Um, it seems like that rumor... I don't know if it's been confirmed of course because anybody didn't know wouldn't confirm it because they're trying to keep it a surprise but it does seem like they are bringing more than one of the Fox um, characters back for that movie so I wouldn't be surprised (sighs) if we saw Electra oh god help us all cute Midwest perky Jennifer Garner as the Greek assassin Electra let's let's do that again because that worked so well the first time yeah dumpster fire dumpster fire by the way if you want to hear Daredevil reviewed and you find out about the real, I feel like Ric Flair, the real world champ. You want to hear about the real Electra? The Daredevil episodes in the archives, kids. You need to go check it out because it's, I think we killed it. I think it's really well done. And plus the show was awesome. The show is much you. better than that uh, movie. The movie of which, again, I thought we'd agreed to never speak of. So, Yeah. Get a third guy on the show and all prior agreements are out the window, I suppose. Next thing you're going to be telling me is there was an X-Men Part 3, which I thought we'd agreed. I didn't say anything about X3. I don't even know what you're talking about. Hey, we did review it on the show, Ray. We don't like to talk about it, but we did review that show or that movie. Uh, no comment. <laughs> oh my I don't know what you're talking about. No. <laughs> well, here's one we can all agree on. They only made terminator one and two and they didn't make anything after that now, i think we all agree on that one yes yeah because it's factual <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know what why would i why would i disagree with something that's the actual fact yes <laughs> there's only two i don't know what you're talking about of course exactly there are yeah. only three two <laughs> the, listen the fact is in my opinion every netflix show from marvel ended too soon but they all kind of feel like they ended too soon. This show especially. Phil, do you think a season three would have been enough to tie the bow on it, or could you have just kept going? Do you think there was enough story to go season four or no? Yeah, I think you could have done a season three. You could have done a Hero for Hire show with her, him and, and Finn, possibly. Mm. Um, Yeah. Now I just keep thinking, like, we should get a season four, because we got season three of Jessica Jones, didn't we? You did. We should get a season four that just starts with her pregnant. Oh, 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 oh. I'm there. I love it. Oh, and if you thought Jessica Jones was cranky and ill and impossible to be around before, wait till she's got morning sickness. I'm just saying. Whoa. It should just start with se- start season four with her pregnant, and they don't tell us who the baby, who the father is, and then 
Coulter just shows up on the episode, oh. and that's how we find out. Oh, I'm so here for it. <laughs> I am there. I am oh. there. And she can't cover it. She can't. She can't have booze anymore. Dude, Jessica Jones that can't have booze. Okay. Oh, oh my god. That's like coming out of her would be insane. Oh my god. Yeah. Because I remember. Because uh, we find out that uh, she's pregnant in the comics in New Avengers. Correct. I think you're right. Yeah. So all of that stuff is like that. I know their wedding is New Avengers annual number one. Ah, oh, well done. I can't remember if, but and they have the kid by then, so I don't remember if she's pregnant by the start of the book or if they've already had the kid by the start of the book. Mm. Um, I'm pretty certain she finds out she's pregnant at the end of Alias, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think you've got it, Marvel. If you're listening, and I know you are, because I know the Marvel people <laughs> I know are. You, are. <laughs> you don't know the Marvel people are fans of the Six M. Hey, you never know. We got an M. We got their M in the name, for God's sake. I mean, you know, we gave them some love. I got no money from them. Still waiting for that check. You know, shouting them out the way we do. But, uh, yeah, dude, I, I think that's freaking brilliant, man. Yeah. I, I love yeah. it. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right. The alias ends with her telling Luke she's pregnant. Uh, I'm pretty certain. So I'm pretty sure she's pregnant once New Avengers starts. Mm. By the way, we talked about the real Electra. Shout out Elodie Young as Electra not like Electra Nachos. Because she's the real Electra. I'm just saying. It's cool, guys, because the truth of the matter is Marvel fans are loyal and Marvel fans are here for the Easter eggs. Marvel fans are here for the references. Marvel fans are here for the cute moments. Charlie Cox showing up in the Spider Man movie and catching that brick as it came through the window is look, how do you give I am Iron Man. I could do this all day. Wakanda forever. How do you have those iconic moments that people will never forget and quote till the end of time? And then you get Charlie Cox catching a brick to come through a window when maybe a lot of people in the theaters had never watched the Daredevil show, but popped because they knew it was Matt Murdock. And you just get him saying, I'm a really good attorney. Like, and that's become one of fans' favorite scenes of all time. It's certainly mine. They can do this, guys. They can do a Luke Cage thing. They can, as Phil suggested, Jessica Jones is pregnant. He just pops in. They can pop Cage into any MCU film, and I think it would work as a cameo, and then it leads to something else. There's so many options here. Marvel's not perfect. Sometimes they release things. It's lukewarm. I get it. Not everything can be a hit. I understand. Not everything can be Black Panther. But... Yeah. Dude, they feel there's so many things they could do here. Even if they don't want to green light the show because they don't know if people are interested. We've already green lighted the Daredevil show. Have Daredevil go, hey, I know a friend that might know something. Shows up at her office. She comes around the pre- corner pregnant. Ooh. There, there's, your, there's your teaser for the show. And Matt around the corner can hear two heartbeats. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, he can hear, hear two heartbeats, and then he's just like, if somebody else here, and then Coulter walks in the room. Or or this is how Jessica finds out she's pregnant, because of Matt. Because Matt hears the two heartbeats. Also could be good. There's stuff that they could do here. Again, I know that there's probably no rush to green light um, any of the other Netflix shows, and I know that Daredevil was the most popular of them. Mm. Um, but... I think it'd be a shame if we never see Kristen Ritter as Jessica Jones again, or if we never see Coulter as Luke Cage again. Hundred percent agree. Um, the writers are back, guys. They're they're signing the deal, and that they got paid. Good for them. Creators should be paid. Let that be a lesson to you. Let that be a lesson to you, white billionaires that don't want to pay up. Okay, pay the writers. Not the writers. We don't have any of this good stuff. Yes. So. Let's start writing some Luke Cage stuff, man. Let's get on it. What are we waiting on? Come on. Yeah. While you're at it, pay comic creators, man. All yes. the creators that you get these ideas from and you make multi million dollar movies from, pay them pay them what they're worth for their ideas, their designs. Pay them what they're worth. Yeah, we do not need a repeat of Jack Kirby. We do not need a repeat of Bill Finger. We don't need a repeat of comic artists, creators that die penniless and alone. We don't need that anymore. Yeah. Amen. Pay up. Pay up. 
Ray, what do you think about the idea of going back to revisit this and and just full blast dead on hitting Disney Plus? You know, we're going to go we're going to we're going to, you know, full force on every show and, you know, take your time, of course, and do it the right way. Are you down for phase two, so to speak, of Marvel Netflix this time on Disney Plus? Yeah, I mean, because they were really good shows. And I feel like if the writers, you know, you know, put their input in and, you know, it still had that gritty feel, even though it's Disney Plus. Yeah, why not? I mean, I don't know how edgy they could be because I know what the Netflix stuff, you know. Mm. Things got a little, you know. I mean, Daredevil is on Disney Plus, so mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and so is Punisher. Mm-hmm. That's true. So yeah, I'm all for it. That you you have to have a third season of Luke Cage. Bottom line, yeah. Like mm-hmm. I felt like that that series just ended with a lot of like what ifs, and you know, there was no closure as to how things were going to progress as him being the kingpin. Yeah, um, Barenthal is back, isn't he? He's back for the Punisher. I'm sorry, the Daredevil show. He is. Yeah, he is. Good. Um, he's fantastic. Um, his show is also very good. Very violent. <laughs> very good show. Extremely oh, violent. That's an understatement. John Barenthal. Uh, you know, we've said on the 6M for a long time, kids, that of course, and these are things that we all know now. I don't know why anyone would ever argue the point now. Downey was born to play Iron Man. Evans was born to play Captain America. These are things that you know. They, these are These are understood now. Barenthal was born to play Frank Castle. There is no, I'm telling you. I mean, as dude, as great as Ray Stevenson was, as as great as Thomas Jane was in his incarnation, I mean, we don't talk about Dolph Lundgren, but as, as great <laughs> as those two incarnations were, Barenthal was born to play Punisher. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, ugh, awesome. that's a, that's another great thing that you could have done with the twist from season two is that that could have put him at odds with the Punisher. Oh yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my god. I'm in my head I'm writing season 3 as we speak. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I I love the idea of him like running in this nightclub and he like just learns of all this stuff happening in his nightclub. He doesn't know anything about Luke Cage and then he runs in and tries to shoot him and realizes that he's bulletproof. <laughs> and and speaking of running into Episode one, when the kid's trying to run into the back of the building and, and runs into him and falls down like he hit a brick wall. Did everybody pick up on that? Yes. Incredible. So good. so good. And like, if you don't know what you're watching, you don't really know. Maybe he's just clumsy. No, 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 no. He ran into Luke Cage. That's what happened. Like, <laughs> you can't move him. You can't move the guy. He's a brick wall, man, by himself. Yeah. Such oh a great, God. such a great show. Um, and such a great realization of Luke Cage. Um, it is cool that Luke Cage has had this entire like second life after um, Bendis uh, reinvented him. So mm. I, I do think we should see Luke Cage at some point again on television. I agree. I've been on the, on a Defenders run for the past couple of years. I've almost completed the entire run of the of the uh, comics. I think I've got ten books or less left to have the entire series. And then after that, I'm telling you, I, I think I'm going to go Luke Cage. But I, I know Luke Cage, don't quote me, but I think it started off as Power Man and Iron Fist and then became Luke Cage, a solo book, and then went back. I'm not sure. But that might be the next goal is to start collecting that that series as well. Um, I'm pretty sure you're right. Uh, but, of course, I didn't collect either. Um, so I'm pretty sure you're right, though. I have some Luke Cage from that other series when they gave him the black jacket and the, you know, the red shirt and they kind of trying to change him up. Um, I have some of those, but I don't know that I have any old school Luke Cage unless it was appearances in other books. I really would love to know the issues that, that, uh, <laughs> that panel of him asking, uh, Dr. Doom, where's my money, honey? Where, I wonder what book that's from. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to say it's the right time for it to bring this show back. But to be honest with you, this show doesn't really depend on the mood. In other words, oh, it's oh, Tom, it's superhero fatigue. It's not with this show, Ray, because this isn't your typical comic book show. There's not, there's no suits, there's no capes, there's no magic hammers, there's no suits of armor. This is all street level. I mean, this could work on any network at any time. 
in any era. So this could work now just as good as it worked before, yeah? 100%. I mean, there's nothing that would prevent them from releasing a new series just because, like you said, there's no, you know, kooky outfits and, you know, these superpowers and lasers and all that stuff. It doesn't have any, you know, Star Wars or Star Trekian type of vibe. It's it's very unique. It's gritty. It's raw. And, you know, they could run that anywhere. I mean, I think you're going to have to put it definitely on, on, a, on a channel that's, you know, PG-13 because, you know, it gets a little raunchy at some points. But other than that, dude, you got to keep that show alive. That show was so good and the characters were fantastic. Oh, I agree. And to answer the question, it's a reference to the 1973 comic Luke Cage Hero for Hire number nine, in which Luke attempts to collect money owed to him by Dr. Doom, and in which he says the same line to Doom, where's my money, honey? Yes. And if I remember correctly, the amount of money was $200. <laughs> oh, that's great. When my men reported a crazy black man, the Fantastic Four's craft, I knew it had to be you. <laughs> Jeez. Oh That's what he says. That's what Doom says. Oh, my God. Money? What money are you talking about? Then he goes, you mean the money I owed you for tracking down my robots? What is it? Uh, yeah, robots. You came all the way here for that? A paltry $200? You are crazy. I, you know, not to bring up Mel Gibson because you know reasons, but Payback is a great movie. I'm sorry. It's freaking great. Uh, and and remember, he's getting revenge on the gang, and it was like nothing. It was a few thousand dollars, wasn't it? That's all it was. It was nothing. Yeah. Because <laughs> they couldn't believe he was doing all this for a few thousand dollars. I forget what the number is now. <laughs> oh, my God. It's great. And you know what, the, the Phil, that's the interesting thing about the Luke Cage character is putting him smack dab in the middle of the MCU means putting him up against the armored guys and, and, you know, wizards and all this other stuff. And then you got Luke Cage with his hoodie. But I kind of actually love the way that looks and I love that it's different. And again, it shows all the different levels of the MCU. You know what I mean? I think it'd be fine. Yeah, one of my favorite things, I can't remember if Bendis, Bendis wrote this issue of New Avengers, um, but it was during Civil War where he like uh, he refuses to, of course, register. He refuses to leave his home. So the entire the entire comic is him fighting all of these guys that are coming to try and take him in. It's great. I say this has all got me wanting to go back and read that New Avengers run. Yeah, I've yeah. got oh, man, I've got so many of those books, dude. Yeah, I don't remember if I still have all of them, but I, 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 I believe that was a Civil War tie-in for New Avengers um, yeah. that I'm talking about. Dude, New Avengers was the hottest book in comics at one time. It was. Um, I don't think people remember, um, but part of the reason that Avengers became what X-Men was in the 90s was because, A, what Hitch did with the Ultimate stuff and what Brian did with the Avengers book later on. Mm, well done. Yeah. Yeah. God, I really enjoyed that book. Really enjoyed that book. So much fun interactions in that book. The chemistry between the the chemistry between characters who aren't real who were drawn on a page. I'm using yes. the word chemistry, but you know what I mean. Like it has the feel of real people talking, man. It did, and and Bendis uh, kind of did the unthinkable before that time period, and he made Spider Man and Wolverine Avengers because before mm -hmm. that there were always cameos in Avengers books. It's true. Yeah, that's true. Well. I, again, I, I love that we all came into this of the same agreement, same mindset. We're all leaving in the same mindset. We don't do a lot of bickering on this show, kids, in case you haven't figured it out. Not a lot of bickering here. Because, uh, I, I, you know, I don't, you know, I don't mind disagreeing with people. I don't even mind podcasting with people that I, that I don't see eye to eye on. I, I like not having the same view as everybody. And not everybody has to have the same view as me. But look, the, the, the basis of doing the 6M to begin with is to talk to my friends about stuff I love to talk about. That's why I'm doing this. I'm not here to, well, let me put people on here that I'm pretty sure is going to, you know, piss me off and I'm going to hate talking to them. And nah, that's okay. <laughs> not for me, man. <laughs> it's just not for me. I, I, you know, dude, I, well, there was a comment made to me one time that, man, I, I, I've never gotten along with a host like this, man. On, on my other show, we disagree all the time. 
And I'm like, I don't want to do shows like that, man. Like, even if we have differing opinions, it's okay. None of this is real. Why are we getting out of, upset over something that's not real? You know what I mean? So, Amen. Well, if you're a pro wrestling fan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. People getting upset at each other over weird stuff. Well, kids, there you have it. There's Luke Cage. We went an hour and a half. We could go another hour and a half and keep singing this uh, the show's praises and talk about a lot more stuff. But yeah, that's that's basically what we've got for you in a nutshell. Again, we're all the agreement that this show should come back and definitely my culture should return. So we will see what the future holds. Before we take this home, Ray, you get to go first. Give me your last word on Luke Cage. Great, gritty show with so much depth. You got to you got to continue it. I said that it, it there's there's a lot there that they could really add on to and mm. Please bring Bushmaster back because I love that guy. It's great. What do you think, Phil? Yeah, I think at the time when they were trying to build up the Netflix universe, um, this was a first of its kind show. It was very different from Daredevil. Um, again, at the time, this was the blackest Marvel property that they had done to date. Um, and man, I think at that time period, and it was just such a great show, and it was such so it's such an innovative show for a comic book show. Hmm, hundred percent, yeah. And I got I'll parrot everything you guys said, and I will go a step further and go back to a, a point we made earlier. I want to see heroes heroes for hire. I want to see him and Danny Rand and that despicable daredevil atrocity that we agreed to never speak of. Look, let's be honest. You know, Marvel could have maybe left it alone. But they didn't. We got an amazing show with an amazing set of actors who absolutely crushed it. And I'm not suggesting you recast Finn Jones. I like Finn Jones a lot. I think if you give Finn Jones another bite to Apple, I think he'd be, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he'd never want to do this again. But I suspect as an actor who likes a challenge, he might look at that and go, I'd love to do it right this time. I'd love to get it right. Let's get it right. And I, I think, I mean, I would love to see him back with, with Coulter. So never say never about any of this stuff, kids, because anything can happen. Marvel's got deep pockets and stories that only go back, I mean, it only goes back to the 60s. I mean, that's all. So it's, what, 70 years or whatever the number is of stories you could tell. So that's all, you know. But uh, while other publishers can't seem to get it right with that much of a backlog, Marvel continues to, again, not get everything right, but... Do, do right by the characters, get the right creators on board, tell amazing stories that last forever. And uh, yeah, I'm curious to see what happens. Fingers crossed, kids, that we'll see Mike Coulter back soon as Luke Cage. We'll promote the heck out of this and tag him everywhere and see if he'll give us a tip of the cap or the tiara, so to speak. That'd be quite fun. But in the meantime, kids, that is Luke Cage. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. Check out our social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at 6M Podcast. We'll see you next time.